digestive system necessary to develop into a chicken. All it needs is to take in energy, and so it happens. But you see, it's programmed to do that. It has the machinery to do that, just like a green plant. A green plant can absorb carbon dioxide and nitrogen. It can absorb water and phosphorus, sulfur, and so forth, and convert that into a very complicated thing. No problem with the second law of thermodynamics because it has the machinery. It has photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is an incredibly complex machinery. Not only does it have to have photosynthesis, it's got to have all those other metabolic machines in that cell. The problem for the evolution is to explain where that machinery came from in the first place. That's the problem. Do you mean to tell me that ultraviolet light coming down on nitrogen and carbon dioxide and so forth will convert that into photosynthesis, the complicated machinery absolutely required for life? Well, that is pure nonsense. Even ammonia cannot survive in the presence of ultraviolet light. Ammonia is decomposed by ultraviolet light, and if that can't survive, then how could amino acids survive, or purines, or pyrimidines, or DNA, or protein? Now, Dr. Flammer says, this is nonsense about molecules decaying and deteriorating. Well, he certainly doesn't know anything about biochemistry. When we isolated vasopressin from the posterior pituitary gland, when I was working at Cornell University Medical College, it's isolated from the posterior pituitary gland. We take that material, 500 units per milligram, put it in an ampule, put it under nitrogen, seal it, and put it in the deep freeze. And yet, Week after week, just test the activity, go from 500 units per milligram to 450 to 400 to 300 and right down to zero eventually. Yes, molecules do deteriorate. That's true of DNA, that's true of our, anybody who's worked with DNA does know you have to do everything you can to preserve that material because it does deteriorate. Dr. Heimer never answered this question about the origin of the universe, the origin of the universe. The universe is an isolated system. It is a closed system. The second law of thermodynamics does apply to its origin. And the second law of thermodynamics says a closed system, an isolated system, can never start in a state of disorder and transform itself into a state of order and complexity. He never even tried to answer that question. If the natural laws are destroying the universe, how could they create it? I'd like a rational answer to that. Of that question. Now he says about probability. I don't. I can't get what he what he meant by that. If you're going to throw in a jumble of words, you're going to get. What are you going to get out of? You're going to get nonsense. That's all. You're not going to get a message. We have messages here on this paper. Here's a message. There's a message. It conveys information. Now you just didn't throw all these letters into a hat and shake them up and get that message. And you never get that message that way. Not in a million years. Not in 500 billion years would you get that message. By the way, you know what this message is? It's a letter of agreement by Isaac Asimov to permit the use of, of his movies and pictures, either in video, in movies, in stills, and so forth, given to the Dutch group that's filmed the series How the World Came to Be. And yet these people, these evolutionists here in Australia, have slandered the creationists by claiming that Dr. Asimov had not given permission to use his portion in the film series, How the World Came to Be. Well, I'm not accusing Dr. Asimov of lying, but I'll tell you one thing, his memory's pretty short. Because here's the letter right here that he signed, a signed agreement. Now to accuse creationists of using that film material against his will and without his permission is a slanderous untruth. It is not true. They did have permission. Now, this story about what happened in Livermore, California. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a school teacher up there that did something he should not have done. Something that none of the creation scientists would have wanted him to do because he used... He used books that were not written for use in public schools. The Institute for Creation Research, for example, has published books devoid of any reference to the Bible or the book of Genesis or religious literature of any kind designed for use in public schools. That teacher published, uh, purchased books 
that were published specifically for use in Christian schools. And therefore, he violated school policy and he's reprimanded for it. And none of us would have defended it. And it has nothing to do with what we're trying to put in the public schools. We don't want to put religion in the public schools. We don't want to teach Genesis in the public schools. First of all, we would like the way most of the teachers would teach it. And in the United States, I know you don't have that law here, but in the United States, you can't do that under the present interpretation of the courts. And so we have no intention to do that. Look. They accuse us. Are they accusing us of being censors or book burners or something like that? That's sheer nonsense. In the United States, 86% of the American people want creation taught in the public schools. Only 8% wants evolution only. 6% had no opinion. All right, 86% to 8. What's happened? They can only teach evolution. Is that democracy? Is that academic freedom? All we want is the scientific evidence. That's what we want, Todd, the kind of evidence that I presented tonight. Now, if somebody wants to try to refute it, if one wants to talk against it, that's fine. Let's have our arguments and our case and our scientific evidence, let them have theirs, and then let the students decide for themselves. I think you students are intelligent enough to make a, a careful decision. I think you can weigh the evidence. I don't think you have to be subjected to brainwashing by people who consider themselves to be the intellectual elite the possessors of the soul truth, and therefore they must protect the students from error. I don't think that's true at all. That's now, this claim about the Creation Science Foundation, $92,000, they just disappeared. You see, the implication is clear that somebody in that foundation absconded with those funds. Let me tell you, they had some reserve funds which they invested at the advice of some investment firm and the rascal in the firm has sconded with the fund. So let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. Recently, in the United States, E.F. Hutton had invested $40 million in a, an investment firm, and somebody in that firm absconded with all that money, including billions of dollars that belonged to other people. Now, are you going to accuse E.F. Hutton of being a bunch of crooks or something like that? Listen. The Institute for Creation Research, we have reserve funds too. We're not going to put that under the carpet. We're not going to hide it. We are going to invest it somewhere to give us a return. Now, of course, if you want to be absolutely safe, you put it in insured bonds or something like that. But sometimes <coughs> there are people you trust who promise you a good return and you invest your money and you lose it sometimes. But to accuse the creationist of, of being somehow guilty of fraud or thievery or something like that is, is downright shameful. Now, these things about the proteins. I said, I made a statement, verbal statement, never published it, never put it in print, that the albumin of humans are more similar to that of frogs than that of, of chimps, or at least as similar. The statement that I was repeating was made by Dr. Garnus Curtis, an evolutionist. He made that in a lecture I heard at the University of California at Davis a number of years ago. I accepted it. He certainly did not, if, if, if there was a joke on anybody, it was on the people who were using proteins to date. He's a radiophenologist. He was trying to put down this idea of using proteins to date things because he believed in geophenology. And so if there's a joke on anybody, it was on, the, it was on the people who used this protein. And I used that. And then people say it's not true, and then they say that I've somehow lied about it or something like that. And about the proteins of man, more like that of a chicken than that of an egg. Well, if you look at the lysozyme, human lysozyme, and lack albumin, and then look at the lysozyme of a chicken, you'll find that the lysozyme of man is more like the lysozyme of chicken then it's like lack albumin of humans. And yet the human lysozyme and lack albumin is both split off much later than the earlier split. And if you just looked at this data blind, if you didn't know where these proteins came from or what they were, you would say on the basis of that data, man was more similar to the chicken than he was to the ape. And that's, if you're going to look at the data in an objective manner, that's what you would have to decide. Now, how much more time do I have? Two minutes. And Dr. Plymer went through this so-called creation model. Oh, by the way, let me, do, let me do this. 
all this stuff about Noah going out and giving their family. It's a lot of nonsense. He never read the Bible, obviously, because the Bible says God brought the animals to the ark. Noah didn't go out and search for them. Says that the Bible says only those land dwelling, air breathing creatures had to go on the ark, and there's only about 20,000 such species today, not 4 million. And so, what he's talked about is <laughs> simply not a mountain. Now, here's an article that appeared in the Australian Science Teacher's Journal, May of 1986, on page 37, by a science teacher, an Australian science teacher. The abstract reads as follows. The evolution versus creation debate has come to Australia. Some evolutionists contend that creationism is pseudoscience because creationists introduce a supernatural being into science. From the standpoint of the philosophy of science, this view is erroneous. 